Well, Steve, welcome to Rep Talk. Thank you for joining us this morning. Good to see you. So happy you're here. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a while now. Uh, you and I, we didn't really meet meet, but I first came across you. You were one of the keynote speakers at the Hardy meeting last year, uh, December of 2019 down in New Orleans, back when we used to travel right. <laughs> before, when we were still traveling on the road. And uh, uh, your presentation really struck me, and I'm sure it struck a lot of people as I looked around the room how, how engaged people were. And uh, I'm so happy you're here to talk about one book in particular. I know you have several books, Ditch the Pitch, The Art of Improvised Persuasion. So what are the other two books, just so we can tell our, listen, our, our audience? Yeah, my first book was called Brand Harmony. It basically recognizes that the way people make decisions about what companies they want to do business with is not based on the promises we make in our ads or our sales presentations. It's how the entire experience of dealing with that company, all the interactions blend to tell one story, a unified brand experience, what I call brand harmony. Excellent. My second book is called We, the Ideal Customer Relationship. It's about how do your customers have that feeling of partnership. We all talk about being partners, but this book talks about how you do it and how you get customers frame of reference to be we, not us and them. And the third book was Ditch the Pitch, the one we're focusing on now. So please explain what you mean by improvised persuasion. Well, one thing we know about all of us is that we don't like to be on the receiving end of sales pitches. I don't, know, I don't think I've ever met anybody who likes to be on the receiving end of a sales pitch. And it's interesting. I, I have fun sometimes I ask audiences, how do you feel when somebody's laying a sales pitch on you? And they say things like, they don't care about me. They care about themselves. I feel like I'm marginalized. It's all about them. Um, how do they know anything about what I care about? And so the reality is if we go into a presentation or sales conversation, deciding ahead of time what we're going to say, the odds that the, we're going to say the right thing for that customer at that moment is about one in a billion. I mean, even if you know somebody, how do you know what where their head's at right now? So what Ditch the Pitch talks about is just tearing up that script, tearing up any notion of preconceived, any preconceived ideas about what you're going to say. Sure, you're prepared. You know your product. You know other things about your customer. But you go in there ready to create the right conversation for this customer at this moment. Your, your focus is not on, on making a presentation. It's on turning the presentation into a conversation that matters to that person. And to create that conversation that matters, you've got to be on your toes, alert, and deciding how to navigate this particular conversation to make it the right conversation for this person. And guess what? That conversation is a conversation that's never happened before in the whole history of the world. Priceless. Brand right? New right now. So what you're saying is don't not necessarily go in without a plan. I mean, we all like to plan ahead oh, for sure. our meetings and our sales, yeah. you know, have an idea. And for me, that's what really struck me personally is because in my, in my educational background, learning how to become a teacher, we were taught objectives, right? Lesson yeah, planning, sure. right down in my mind, you know, I'm not a salesman by nature, but what you're saying actually made me step back. And I was so focused on that presentation. And that's actually the phrase that stuck with me, turn every presentation into a conversation. I, it just, yeah. Uh, well, I think when you were a teacher, you had objectives you wanted the kids to learn. You had a lesson plan, but each kid in that class, you did differentiated learning. You personalized this kid needs this approach to this material. This kid, kid needs this approach to this material. Same thing happens to our customers. Our customers buy from us not because of what we're selling. They buy from us when they believe they'll be better off doing business with us. It's about them, right? And so Absolutely. what you're trying to do is identify what would make this customer say, I, I'm so much better off if I did business with this person. And, and when you're alert and using what we'll talk about, the ditch the pitch habit, you can identify ways to do that and navigate a personalized, improvised conversation that's right for this person. It's funny you say that exact thing because um, that's what I learned after two years of middle schoolers. It wasn't about the content. It was about the children. It was about the kid. And that's exactly what you're, you know, what you're saying here. Yeah. You know your content already. You're a technical you know, guru. You're savvy. You know your business. So, so please, you know, what habits should we be practicing? I know you see there's six of them, and I love you have a, um, a pocket guy too, but why don't you talk to us about sure. these great sure. practices or habits? Sure. So a habit, let's face it, we all know what a habit is. A habit is something that we can do regularly without thinking about it. Now, what's interesting, Rob, is that sometimes people say to me, well, wait a minute, Steve, you're talking about improvisation and habits. Aren't those two things like in conflict? Well, actually, they're not. If you think about it, improvisation is not completely winging it. You know, I, I, one of my favorite hobbies, I play jazz guitar. And jazz has a lot of improvisation, in it, right? And I could meet some jazz musicians that I've never met before and we could play together and improvise together. So how can we improvise if we don't know each other? Because we have 
certain idioms and habits and things that we that serve as a platform on which to improvise. So if we can get some really good conversational habits down, we'll be able to create the right conversation for each person. Um, because we, like when you're improvising, you're improvising off of a structure. You're just like, like in jazz as a song, it's got certain chord progressions and melodies and you improvise off that. Same thing with a customer. You've got your knowledge of your products, you've got your knowledge of them and you improvise based on those tools. So the, the ditch the pitch habits, there's six of them. And the idea is to, as I said, create great conversational habits to help you improvise the right conversation with each customer. And the, the first two habits fall into the heading of figuring out what's going on. You know, one thing we have to realize is that a lot of salespeople go into a conversation with a customer thinking, I know what's going to happen here. I'm going to tell them about this, then I'm going to tell them about this, and I'm going to tell them about this. And then they'll sign, but you don't know what's going on. You got to be very humble when you enter a customer conversation saying, I got to be open to what's happening here. And the first, the first habit is called think input before output. What, what does that sound like to you? Sounds like garbage in, garbage out to me, kind of, right? It's like, yeah, input. You got to figure out what the input is, right? You got to figure out what the person's, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Most sales what kind people, of day they're having. <laughs> well, sure, exactly. All those yeah. kinds of things, right? Because, you know, if you think about it, the way most salespeople are trained, it's like, okay, I'll make my presentation. I'll tell you about my products. I'll tell you about our latest promotions, our latest new products, our latest whatever. And then I'll get your feedback, right? I tell you, and then I see if you want to buy from me. We want to flip that around 180 degrees. Your, your sales conversation is going well when you get into it. Your customer's doing more of the talking than you are. Um, you think about all the reasons why. First of all, a customer's be more likely to talk to you and engage with you if you're listening to them. You know, every ditch the pitch habit has three practices associated with it because we know in our lives, practice makes good habits. So one of the practices we teach for, that goes with this first habit, thinking input before output, is called say less to notice more. Mm -hmm. Just talk less. Most salespeople talk too much. Now think what happens when you talk less. Yes, you notice more. We'll get to that in a second. But human beings love to hear themselves talk. So if you were in there making a pitch, your customer's probably spacing out and thinking about their next meeting or their little league game they got to practice. Got to exactly. Coach tonight with their kids. But if you're doing less of the talking and they're doing most of the talking, they're going to be completely in the conversation with you. So you get them engaged. But also... When you're thinking input before output and really getting that information from your customer, you have such a competitive advantage. If you think about it, one of your, your, your best competitive advantages are not your products. Sure, your products are great, they're awesome, right? But the knowledge of your customer is a better competitive advantage. I mean, imagine if your competitor was there a half hour before you and they spent all their time talking about the features and benefits of their product, right? And their credentials and all these things, right? Great, wonderful. Then you come in and sure, you spend a little time on your product. You spend most of the time hearing about what the customer's needs are. You know so much more about that customer than your competitor does. You have such an advantage. So customer knowledge is, is such a great competitive advantage. Input for profit helps you gather that information. So it's a, an excellent point you're making here. And in terms of what we're dealing with and, and a couple of things, actually. So as reps, we've all gone into our, our appointments that we made, but you go in and you find out the guy's having a really bad day. You might actually have to reschedule the appointment. You have to like wing it that way too. Oh yeah. You know, and then, okay, it's not my, what I have to say is not that important right now. That's a self-realization, like realizing, okay, this guy's going to think of me way more or way uh, higher, a better person. If I just let him go the rest of the day, not bother him and, and allow me to come back later. But the thing, you know, that you just mentioned too, differentiation. Okay, everybody's, you know, wants to come in and pitch. And I think, like you said before too, everybody knows when they're being pitched. In terms of our world too, I can kind of relate that. A lot of guys, a lot of contractors will go into the house, right? And say the same thing. We have the highest efficiency equipment. We have, you know, we can make you the most comfortable. But I have our guys, I challenge our guys to say, hey, you know, they probably got four other quotes and those four other quotes are all saying the same thing. Why don't you ask them about that air purifier over in the corner? Why do they have it? Is somebody, you know, yes. is somebody, yes. guess what? They're going to remember you. <laughs> and it's just asking, like you're saying, ask the question and just be quiet. Let it go. Let them talk. Like if you're the only contractor in that story who discovers a child has really bad asthma or that they're germaphobes or that whatever it is, and you're going to like, say, show empathy, hear it, and, and say, well, let's talk about how we're going to address that issue for you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, really simple part of what you just said here is we should always remember, you know, ask yourself this question. It's a really easy question. Who do your customers care about more? You or themselves? 
Of course they care about themselves. So who are you going to talk about? You or them, right? Yeah. And, like, and who are they going to remember? The right. guy that asked them about their kid and their allergy. <laughs> right, exactly, because it's about them. They're, you know, every human being is walking around in their, with a personal life story in their mind. Last night, yesterday, you were all living your life stories. You went to bed last night. You woke up this morning, picked up right where you left off. Same with your customers. Don't make them jump out of their personal story that they're so familiar with and, and read about your features and benefits. Enter their story. Oh, your child has asthma. Let's talk about what that means to your family, whatever it might be. There you go. Yeah. Or if it's a distributor, it's like, what are, what are your challenges in getting your customers to prefer you versus other distributors? Find out what their issues are and then help them solve those issues. I love what you just said. Enter their story. That will stick yeah. with me. Enter their they story. They don't care about their story, not your. They don't care about your story. Yeah. They yeah. do not care about your story. They care about their story. You know, when, when we get to habits five and six, we'll talk about how we create a shared story. That's awesome. So think input before output. And the second habit, which is also part of this idea of figuring out what's going on, is a, a, you know, a sibling habit of thinking for output. Habit two is called size up the scene. It's like size up the scene reminds me of if you go to a movie and you show up like 10 minutes late and you're like, oh my, what's happening here, right? You know, you try to figure out what these characters are, where they are. That's what's happening in every single sales conversation because every person you sell to is in the middle of their day, middle of their year, the middle of their career. So you're walking in the middle of their story and you got to say, okay, what's happening? Size up the scene. And when you size up the scene, you're trying to figure out who is this person? Like, what do they care about? How do they make decisions? You want to understand what's going on behind the scenes? Who's influencing them? What is influencing them? And so when you understand like what situation your customer's in and who they are as a human being, then you can really figure out how to sell to them because you can have three buyers who look the same on paper, same demographics, mm -hmm. but they may have different things going on. So you get to know who they are as people. You can adapt your conversation to match them. The input with Propic is the information into your brain. Habit two, size of the scene, is interpreting that information and, and using. Okay. Which should bring us to, once you figure out the scene, three is creating a series of yeses. Explain that for us. Creating a series of yeses. Yeah, our, 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 I mentioned our first two habits about figuring mm -hmm. out what's going on. Mm -hmm. You don't stop it. You're always doing them. You're just mm -hmm. laying them on, okay? layering them on. Habits three and four are about creating a really flowing conversation. We said we want to turn every presentation into a conversation and conversations that matter are the currency of our success here. If you can get customers involved in conversations that matter to them, you'll make more money. You'll sell more product. You'll have more long-term relationships. So habit three and four about creating these flowing conversations. And um, habit three, create a series of yeses, recognizes something that, you know, by the time a customer says yes to you, there's been a lot of little yeses along the way. Yes, I'll meet you. Yes, I'm willing to share some information about my company with you. Yes, I'm willing to hear what you have to say in return. Yes, yes, yes. Boom, gets to them, them making the purchase or making repeat purchases, et cetera. Um, and that's a difficult, that's a challenging thing to do all the time, especially if a customer brings up or, or suggests a certain or make a request of you that you know is the most difficult request to try to accommodate, it. right? And you can't well, that's do an interesting it. point. Yeah. We do we, we, we something in Ditch the Pitch, we call it, there's always something to say yes to. And I, you will never manipulate your customer with Ditch the Pitch. It's totally authentic. If a customer says, can you lower the price on that product? And let's say the answer is no. Well, you know, we're trying to create a flowing conversation, what I call conversational momentum. And yes, is like green lights. You say no, you put a red light up and stop the conversation. You've broken the, 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 the mm -hmm. momentum. There's always something you can say yes to. Like you ask a question, say, well, tell me, what, what are you concerned about with that price, right? Or can you talk, let's talk about what your budget is. Let's figure out what's most important to you. Maybe we can find you know, a way to, to, to take something else out of the quote to make it fit your whatever, right? Yes, yes. So you don't have to just say, no, I can't lower the price. You can figure out yeah. something. There's always something to say yes to. You know, one of, the, one of the practices associated with this will illustrate this point. The first practice, remember each ditch the pitch habit has three practices. The first practice with habit number three, habit number three is create a series of yeses. The first practice is called say yes and. Now this is a principle that they use in stage improvisation. You know, I live here in Chicago, the world yeah. capital of stage improv. Yeah. Back in Second City, like in the 50s, they developed this concept called yes and. And basically what it is, is like, whatever your scene partner offers you, you find a way to acknowledge it and affirm it and build mm -hmm. upon it. Now, as we said, when we're selling, you know, like, look, if you and I were improvising a, a scene on a stage right now, and you said, you know, 
wow, it's hailing, hailstones the size of golf balls. And I said, I looked up at the sky and said, no, it's sunny no, out. It's not, dies. But right. if I go, oh, what hit me on the head? Then I've, <laughs> I've, I've taken your offer and built it on mm-hmm. it, right? Now, the same thing in the sales process. Your customer says, you know, let's, let's go back to the example you gave before. A contract is talking to a consumer, a homeowner. The homeowner says, yeah, my, my child does have asthma. You know, how does that affect the way you want to have your air quality in your home? What kind of situations yeah. make it happen? You start building on it and yeah. say, yes, I want to hear about that. You affirm it. You're not always exactly using the word yes. You're using the feeling of yes. You're affirming, yes. you're acknowledging, you're moving the conversation forward. A sale is really just a series of yeses that ends up with a big yes. And then hopefully it keeps going on from there for years to come. So don't kill the scene. Don't kill the scene. Just go with the flow really is what you're saying. You watch that. It's a classic. And you talk about it in your, in your book about, and that's what stuck with me too, as, as to help me remember is the improv. You know, you never see two comedians wherever they are, kill it and stop. And they play off of each other, right? It's just playing, play, play, play. Yes, yes, yes. Everybody can go on YouTube and just find some uh, old examples of John Stewart when he was in the daily show. Yeah. interviewing another comedian. I mean, he's just one example of many. I just remember seeing it. Yeah. He gets another comedian on that show with him. All they would do was just one of them would say something. Yes, and yes, and, and pretty soon they have this hilarious thing. All they're doing yep. is taking whatever the first person offers and building on it yep. and accepting it and affirming it and moving and moving the conversation forward. We can learn a lot from it. We can. Jimmy Fallon does it every night. You just watch him play yeah. off his band, play off. Great. Yeah. Yep. Excellent. Ad. Excellent. You know, so where do we move from there? We get the conversation flowing. You're creating a series of yeses. Um, yeah, the next really habit well. is You're... called habit four is called explore and heighten. So just remind us our first two habits: think input for output, and size of the scene are about figuring out what's going on. Our third and fourth habits are about going with the flow. Create a series of yeses is habit three. Habit four, part of going with the flow and creating a great conversation, is called explore and heighten. You know, I think of it like this. There's lots of things that distinguish us humans, you know, opposable thumbs, right? Big social, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, our ability to have conversations and dialogue and create social relationships through language is like one of a kind in the universe, right? And conversational potential is pretty much limitless. Think of your best conversations with friends or loved ones and they could, as good as they were, they could have been even better. And so the goal is how do you make this conversation richer? How do you create the conversation that makes it matter more to your customer. So first point to think about is a conversation's always got a room to be better. Okay, how do you make it? How do you heighten the conversation? Well, this habit is called explore and heighten. Explore is as you're thinking input for output, sizing up the scene, creating a series of yeses, our first three habits, you will inevitably identify things your customer really cares about. Like my child's got asthma, I'm a germaphobe. Mm-hmm. Or, or, or the distributor who feels they're losing business to the distributor across the street. Whatever their issue is, it's really important to them. When you discover that through exploring, you heighten the conversation by focusing on that. I mean, think about it. Let's say one of you listeners, the podcast say, imagine you've got a hobby you really care about, something you're really into, and you want to talk about it. And the first two friends you talk to about it just like blow you off and think about something else. Your third friend goes, wow, can I hear about that? And they spend the next 15 minutes genuinely listening to your enthusiasm about your hobby, you'd feel pretty good, wouldn't you? Now imagine as opposed to being you talking about your hobby, imagine it's your customer talking about something that they really care about. Yeah, they're gonna love you if you're willing to have a conversation about what they care about. So explore and heighten is find the things your customers care about and then focus the conversation on the things they care about. Your job is not to have a conversation about every product you offer, it's to have a conversation about the things your customer really cares about. That's when they're going to love you. And it's okay to find commonality too. Maybe the hobby is the same as my hobby. And boy, what if that happens, right? I mean, again. That is, yeah, that's an opportunity for relationship. <laughs> right. And, and maybe the thing they care about, on the, on, the, on the other hand, could be something that you share in common. Maybe something you don't know anything about or, or excuse me, isn't even an issue for you, but, but you, the customer cares about it. So you focus on that. Remember, they don't care about you. They care about themselves. I mean, sure, they do care about you, but they care about themselves a lot more than they care about you. So focus on what they care about. So tying it into heating and air conditioning, right? If I'm a guy and I hear, you know, maybe a guy likes building models, right? And he works with glue all the time. And here I am in my head, I think a glue and VOCs and all the stuff that must be in his air. Hey, do you ever happen to get headaches from working around this all the time? Just, you know, a leading quest to let him talk. Let him he talk. Might, <laughs> well, he, might, and he might say yes, then you're able to talk about it, right? Yeah, yeah. 
And I mean, think about what's going on here. If you're a, a distributor, you know, most contractors spread their business around a number of distributors, right? Just the mm -hmm. way it goes, right? Mm -hmm. You know, whichever one's on their path that day, or they want to keep everybody on right. the kind of excuses you hear. I've, I've interviewed a lot of contractors on behalf of yeah, they got better popcorn across the street. <laughs> yeah, whatever. So how are you going to turn left into your parking lot versus turning right into somebody else's parking lot? Mm -hmm. And the reality is, like, let's take a distributor's point of view, trying to attract contractors. They all have similar products, right? And even though the products you sell might be better, there's a great range of products. They're going to turn into your parking lot versus somebody else's. I mean, if it's a distributor, I know you're talking about reps yeah. who sell them, but, but based on whether they feel that they're better off doing business with you and the same thing for reps those contractors and distributors are going to focus on you if they think that they are better off working with you that's the key and these habits help help you get people to see they're better off working with you so and it's funny you say this because we on our end and, and distributors will say too we're in a relationship-based business i mean who is it right i always think of well who is it <laughs> i mean yes we're unique that we need those relationships and develop those relationships you know i think any business and you're the expert on this, but it, it's a real, we are definitely a relationship business. Well, how do you further that relationship? And I think you said it best, bring yourself into their world, right? To, to initiate. Yeah, you know, you, you, we talked about, you asked me about the books I wrote earlier and my book, We the Ideal Customer Relationship, which is the book before Ditch the Pitch. Mm -hmm. um, they're very, there's a lot of commonality in the books. Ditch the Pitch really grew out of the book, We. We recognize something in the business to business world, which we're talking about today, mm -hmm. Ready for this, guys? Sorry. Relationships are usually more differentiating than products. Products count. Of course they count. Yes, they do count. But from years and years in my consulting company of doing research in lots of industries with lots of customers, people do think certain products are better than others within a certain range. But relationships they see as being different in a much bigger range. Like, yeah, those, those people's products are pretty good, but they really understand me. Or their products are pretty good. They treat me like a number. You know, the relationship is more differentiated. Yeah. And a lot of times I'll hear, uh, Steve, I'll hear people say, you actually see friendships develop, honestly, in a lot of successful cases here. And it's that because you find, you know, common ground, you develop that relationship. And I was just going to say and make a comment, you know, so far, the four habits I've heard you say, literally, you could use those universally, right? Even our own personal lives. I mean, you're at a cocktail party and you're meeting somebody for the first time. Am I wrong here? I mean, these are pretty I darn... can't say how many times <laughs> I've, been doing ditch the, I've been doing ditch the pitch workshop for years. And some woman will say, I wish my husband would do this. <laughs> or some guy would say, wow, I should try this when I'm dating. You know? There you <laughs> go. <laughs> and I think the reason for that, here's the reason for that. That's not because, just because Ditch the Pitch is so wonderful, it is, but it's because Ditch the Pitch is based on human, natural human conversational tools. This is how we interact as humans. We're a social species. We use language to create relationships, you know? I don't know if you read Yuval Noah Harari's book, Sapiens, which was a big book of life. My years. son read it. Yes, yes, it's I have. Right. And basically yeah. the point yeah. is what got us ahead is our ability to cooperate and have different, we all have different roles. You know, somebody's a contractor, somebody's a distributor, somebody's a homeowner with another job. Guess what? We collaborate and cooperate and all fill our roles. And guess what happens? There's business being done, right? Mm -hmm. We are social creatures who have different roles. You know, all squirrels collect acorns. Humans do different things. And we use our social mm -hmm. structures to, to cooperate to make those things happen. And so conversation is this thing that allows us to do that. So the reason Ditch the Pitch would work in real life is because Ditch the Pitch is trying to say, well, what works in real life and be that, right? Yeah. Um, whereas if you think about the way we tend to think about marketing and sales, things like mass advertising and making people listen to you give a PowerPoint deck are really, really unnatural forms of communication. You know, imagine some, prehistoric society in the Amazon that anthropologists go and look at it. They're, look at it. They're sitting around the campfire. They're not giving each other PowerPoint presentations. They're having conversations. <laughs> That's what humans do, right? Exactly. And so, get, you know, let's talk about what really works as human beings. And this, these habits are trying to say, looking at what works in human, human discourse. So the giving season continues, Steve. If, if a spouse or a significant other wants to give the gift of, of communication, go grab a copy of Ditch the Pitch. Right. Sure. <laughs> All, right. Sure. All right. So we got through uh, three or four. We've explored, we're exploring and heightening this conversation. We're taking yeah. it to the next level. What, where do we go from here? Okay. So we've covered four habits. Mm -hmm. Think input before output inside of the scene, figuring out what's going on. Habits three and four, create a series of yeses and explore and heighten or about creating a flowing conversation. 
Now, habits five and six are about creating the shared story we mentioned. Remember we said that your customers don't care about your story, they care about their story. So as opposed to what most salespeople make people do is jump out of their own story and come look at my PowerPoint deck and all about my products or look at my website, my about us page. They don't care. What you want to do is enter their story and create a shared story. Chapter six of Ditch the Pitch is called Let a Shared Story Emerge. Meaning you don't force it. You create this flowing dialogue where the customer starts in their mind to see, oh, wow, I'd be better off working with them. They start to see their ability to achieve their goals. You know what it is? It's like, in the story in the customer's mind, you're not the hero, you're best supporting actor. In, in the story you're creating about your company with your customer, you're not Luke Skywalker, you're Yoda, right? They're Luke yeah. Skywalker, they're the hero, you're the guy that's gonna Great get them to the yep. where they wanna be. Whether, where they wanna be is just having you know, a warmer basement or a, a cooler summer, or they wanna have more contractors come to their distributorship, whatever their issue is, if they see you as the partner, you know, they're mm -hmm. Yoda getting them what they want, mm -hmm. great. Okay, so how do you do that? Our fifth habit is called focus the conversation on the customer. We've alluded to this already. Since your customers care more about themselves than about you, don't talk about you, talk about them, right? Mm -hmm. Focus the conversation on them. The first way to create this shared story is to make sure you're not making them jump out of their story. You're talking about the issues that, that, that matter to them. The first practice under habit five, habit five is now again, is focus the conversation on your customer. The first practice is this, make 95% of the conversation about the customer. I said that 95% of the subject matter, you only got 5% to talk about your products, your policies, 95% is about them. Now that may seem counterintuitive, but it works because you don't need to tell them everything about you. You need to find things they care about and then relate, connect parts of your offering to what they really care about. So here's a great way for heating and air, air conditioning guys to remember 95.5. That's okay. actually a brazing rod. <laughs> it's 5% silver, 95% okay. filler. Okay. So you want to spend the 95 to get that 5% silver out of that. <laughs> That's great. That's great. I, so 95, five is brazing rod. There you go. You could use that, use it with your heating. Awesome. And air okay, I remember that. that. That's great. Okay. So all those guys out there, they, they're going to know exactly what it's five, right? 95% of the conversation about the customer. Okay, good. And you know what? If the ratios were different, the brazing rod, it might not work. But guess what? <laughs> if you try to put too much of yourself in the conversation, it's not going to hold together. I know people find that counterintuitive, but wait, I have so much to tell them. Well, guess what? If you try to tell them too much, they're not going to remember it. Exactly. If you have a conversation about them, you'll be able to, 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 to get their attention. And by the way, one of my employees, let's call this a hack on, on this, on this uh -huh. practice. It still works. If the customer asks you something and you've got a lot to tell them, like, like, how would this product work in my home or how would this product, how would I sell this to contractors, if it's a distributor or whatever it is, when you start talking about your product, don't just talk about your product, relate it to how they would use it, right? So if you always remember that the goal is not presentation, it's conversation at 95.5, yeah. if you've got to say how this product works, Hey, let's talk about how would your installers install this? How would you write? Yeah, you know, that's interesting. Make, Again, I can make an immediate connection with that, Steve, because when we are talking about indoor air quality enhancements, so a guy quotes a system, right? Furnace and air conditioner. Well, you're talking about enhancements that can improve the breathing air. You don't just tell somebody you, you need a humidifier. You don't, you don't just say you need, uh, yeah, we all know he needs a humidifier, but like you're saying, if you take the time to explain the benefit, are you getting, you know, bleeding noses or scratchy this or you make it you have to uh, make it tangible to them what what difference in their life is it going to make if they have a humidifier right make it tangible so that's right. perfect imagine if two contractors came into my house and i said i want to you know the air is kind of dry in here and they started one guy started talking about humidifiers and just talking about specs the other guy saw my room with guitars in it ah see wood, wood yeah. guitars that get really <laughs> well, got a lot of wood in here steve <laughs> right right and then let's talk about oh this instrument how what happens this and he starts hearing the story about the time this guitar got a crack in it so it's too dry yep. and he talks about that you think i'm more like which guy am i yeah. more likely to buy the humidity yeah. oh joe i'm tuning these things all the time i don't understand what's going on you know like what the... right it's, it's true i can tell if i get home from a business trip and the guitars went flat i know the yeah. went <laughs> there the you went up. Um, and, you know, and it's like if, if a contractor were to come to my house and notice that I care about those things, what do you going to feel to me, right? I mean, that guy might have a more expensive humidifier. His insulation prices might be higher. I'm much more likely to go with him because he's fixing my problem, right? 
Yep. He's not making yep. the first guy's making me do the work of connecting his humidifier to my problem. There the you go. Guy is, is, is helping me make the connection. Make connection. You help him make so, the connection. So focus Huge. the conversation. And by one of the um, other practices related to this, but it's something we call the one paragraph rule. And I want to mention this because this is something that when I train salespeople and ditch the pitch, you know, whether they're younger people, but even especially people mid career or later, they say, you know, I just didn't realize how much I was talking. I was talking too much. So one practice that's related to habit number five is called practice the one paragraph rule or obey the one paragraph rule. The one paragraph rule is really simple. When you've talked about a paragraph's worth of information, stop, leave a break. Let's say you're you know, a rep talking to a distributor trying to explain you know, how a product works or how it's installed or something. It's possible to go on and on and mm -hmm. on with a lot of technical information. Discipline yourself as this rep after about a paragraph's worth of information, stop. Maybe you just give the customer a moment to absorb the information. Maybe you've said, I'm willing to listen to you. Maybe they have a question. Maybe they just don't say anything and you can go on, but stop after one paragraph. Yeah, because maybe what you just said went completely over their head, right? <laughs> or maybe they got How are you going to know that? <laughs> right, right. Exactly, exactly. Like, yeah, you know, the, the, the gymnast needs to do her whole routine for three minutes and then find out what the judges thought. When you're ditching the pitch, you can break it up in little pieces and get there you go. along the way, you know, and adjust your routine, adjust your, Excellent. your conversation. Excellent. It gives you a chance to adjust too, right? Just, oh, yeah, totally. stop, just stop. Ditching the pitch is about navigating, you're constantly navigating. It's like for anybody who's ever sailed before, you're constantly adjusting to the wind. That's what it's like in a conversation. And habit, yeah. ha habit six, mm -hmm. which is about creating the shared story, is called don't rush the story. You know, we're all busy. We've got the next appointment to get to. We want to make our quotas for this month. We've got a million emails to return. So we have a tendency we sell to want to like get there too quickly. And yeah, we want to close sales, but the reality of life is that if we try to move a sale forward too quickly, we'll actually slow it down. Now I'm sure that everybody who's watching or listening to this today um, is an expert in their world. They know their products. Um, they know customers pretty well. I'm sure you, you know, everybody would go into a customer and start talking to them and in about 30 seconds, identify 17 ways to help this customer. Well, guess what? You may understand those 17 ways to help this customer in 30 seconds, but they're not ready to because they, they don't have your perspective. They don't have your expertise. So don't rush the story is about being discerning and only bringing um, information into the customer conversation at a pace that's right for your customer. Don't rush it. If you rush it, you'll probably slow it down. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. There, and that, that's, that's a, that's a challenge for me personally, because I love just go, you know, just, just, you want to, I think yeah. a lot of people just inherently want to just go, you know, but get it, you know, get your story out. And, you know, and yeah. honestly with technicians too, I know it's hard for them because, you know, it might be a really hot day or a really cold day and the calls are stacking up, their phone's ringing off the, you know, the hook and, you know, if they just, you pause and make that connection, it, it's Patience is that much more. Here. And I'm not surprised you said it was a challenge because what I do in a lot of ditch the pitch workshops, I have people rate themselves as of today before they had a chance to practice on which habits are your best, and which are the ones you need the most work on. And so many people, sales people say, don't rush the story. Habit six is the one I need the most work on because we are, we're go-getters. We want to make things happen and we're busy and we're experts. We just cut to the chase. In fact, the, the first practice under, under this habit six, habit six, don't rush the story. The first practice is called don't load the slingshot. Mm -hmm. It's like, I got this metaphor once when somebody was trying to sell to me and he asked me one question and I, I answered it and he said, oh, then you need this, 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 and this, and this. And I felt like he was like just loading rocks and slingshot. And going, you know, what do you do if somebody aims a slingshot at your face? You, you duck, right? Yeah, we don't want our customers ducking when we're talking. We want them engaged. So be conscious of how fast you bring information in. And that's related to the second practice with this habit, which is called leave things in your pocket. Mm -hmm. you know, okay. Your goal is not to tell customers everything about your business or your products or your offerings, whatever. It's to tell them just enough so that they start to form a story in their mind that you can help them and move your relationship forward. And if you do it right, they'll say, can I hear more, right? D leave things in your pocket. Don't tell them everything because you know, we, we think about our, our scarce resources in our business and scarce resources mm -hmm. like the time, money, people are scarce resources. Well, guess what are another scarce resource is besides time, money, and people? 
to your customer's attention. Mm -hmm. Your customer will only give you so much attention. So use it wisely. If you tell them everything, you will inevitably be telling them things that aren't as important as other things. You're crowding out the important things in their mind if you tell them things they don't care about. Leave things in your pocket. As you're engaging in all these habits, you will identify what your customer really cares about. Remember in habit four, explore and heighten, we find out what the customer really mm -hmm. cares about. Focus on those things. Leave the other things in your pocket. Don't pull them out in this conversation. Maybe next week, maybe never for this customer. So I think I owe you and everybody else an apology because I guess what I did, I think I rushed us through the first three habits, but you know what? It's a teaser. <laughs> we'll leave it as a teaser. No, you didn't rush us. So basically, so let's just, so uh, in summary here, I think, uh, of course, there's the book. Uh, I noticed also your website, you're constantly, that's evolving and you actually created, and I downloaded a little pocket, uh, short and sweet, like pocket, uh, pocket guide, or, yeah. there you go. Pocket guide. Thank you. Awesome. And then another thing I noticed, and you could talk about this if you'd like, uh, you also created a online class, right? Online learning. Right. Talk about right. that a little bit. So is that, is that actually ditch the pitch that's online? Yes. And then, yes. Okay. The, the way it works is this, is that ditch the pitch is a practice. People come to a workshop with me and ditch the pitch. They read the book and they get a lot of information and it's great information. I think so. It really works. The trick is do you take that information and practice it. The beautiful thing about learning to ditch the pitch is that, you know, it takes some time to read the book. Okay. But you can practice it. You have the perfect lab for practicing every customer conversation. So our online course does is it over seven weeks, there's an introductory week and then one week per habit. This has people gives them some really structured practice. So like, Let's say you're on habit number two, size of the scene that week. You, we give you tools to practice that habit. So when you're in customer conversations, you can really learn that habit by focusing on it that week. And what I find is over practicing one habit a week and keep layering on, you don't stop the first practice when you get to the second one, you keep layering them on. By the time people get through the whole program, they're starting to get a lot more fluent, um, fluent and fluid with these practices. They know them better and they're more comfortable using them. And then, of course, it doesn't stop there. This practice program lets people, uh, you know, develop these habits, and then you just keep practicing over the years. That's what our online course does. Wonderful. And it's at yastro.com, correct? Yes, Y-A-S-T-R-O-W.com. Excellent. Thank you, Steve. So was that, was that born out of uh, the past 10 months of our lives? That, uh, did that actually come to fruition this past year, or has that been on a while? With the course? That class, the course. Yeah, the well, actual the, course. The course has been on a while, but it's interesting. I've put a lot of people through it. This year, this year, um, and in fact, it's, it's, it's a lot of people have gone through it this year. It's been good because what we focus a lot this year is how we have to sell remotely. In fact, I was dealing with HVAC distributors earlier in the year as this was happening. We started the course in mm -hmm. February, and we're going through March with one group, and we started getting okay. How do we take this? And the, the lesson is there is that it's a little harder on the phone or on Zoom than it is in person. But let's face it, even before COVID, we were doing a lot of work remotely. And the same principles apply. Now, if I'm sitting with a customer in person, I can watch their body language and really have a lot of input to guide my output. On the phone, I gotta be really listening extra intensely to try to understand what's going on. And I have to work extra hard to keep my customer's attention. So, so yes, it, 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 I was doing this course before, um, before COVID, but it's actually been uh, critical this year to, to do it. Yep. And I appreciate one of your more recent articles was exactly that selling at a distance, yeah. which I enjoyed that read because you know, after all we've lived through it, the one question when I in my notes and preparing to talk to you today was, well, geez, how has this changed? You know, now that we are all remote, but you just said, you know, we, we've been doing it all along. It just happens to be really intense right now. Well, let's go back and, to something we've said before, you know, this is based on principles of human conversation. Humans invented language. It, it was evolving before this by a hundred thousand years ago or so anthropologists say we have fully formed language. We had a lot of practice having conversations. So just because now we got to do them on Zoom or more on the phone, realize that we're really talking about is something humans have been doing for 100,000 years. Engage in great conversational principles, whether you're walking through somebody's warehouse with them, talking at their counter, or whether you're uh, it's, uh, whether it's the contractor's in somebody's home, or you're on Zoom, or you're on the phone, it's the same thing. Use these conversational principles to build human relationships. That's when people are going to want to buy from you. So how has this year been for you? Obviously, you know, you're, you're probably not doing much traveling like most of us. Um, what has this year, has this year forced you to rethink anything at all in, in, in the years you've been doing this and your books? Have you started a new book? 
Well, y- yes, yes, and yes. It's interesting. Obviously, it's been a tough year for everybody. It's been just like, you know, yeah. can we wait till this, we're all hoping the 2021 is going to be different. But like many people, I've, I've found some really great lessons and, and some, some opportunities in this year. One thing is that, you know, let's go back to something we said, because I've had to have my relationship building, except with a very small group of, of people like my wife and um, you know, my, my two of my kids who live close by, virtually all of my relationship building has been over, over so much has been over Zoom, right? Yeah. And I haven't seen my parents since January. My relationship is tight as ever with them. My, I have a couple of grandchildren. We're doing great. And I got to tell you, I've met a lot of clients this year. Mm-hmm. I was, one of my assistants and I were talking about this the other day. I've got a lot of people I've never met in person that I met this year. I've only been with them on Zoom or the phone and I've got these great relationships with them and I can't wait to meet them in person. But, you know, what a lesson there that if you really focus on what builds human relationships, what creates great relationship building conversations, and you've got this handicap of not being with them and you ensure that you focus on the most important relationship building and conversational tools, you can actually build relationships. And I'm hoping I'll be able to take that learning and then now I can be with people have even richer relationships. Yeah, yeah interesting. I've experienced a similar thing. I, I, we have manufacturers we're working with right now that I've never met before. I've met them virtually, like you said, and this has this blossomed actually into a great relationship. And we all say the same thing. We look forward to the day we can all have a beer together and actually like we would have done initially just be in person. So I'm, I, yeah, I think we're all hopeful like a, for that. If somebody's a golfer, and they have to golf in a lot of strange winds and crosswinds. Yeah. <laughs> then all of a sudden, when the wind dies down, they're going to be that much better because they've developed these techniques. We've had this handicap of having to be on Zoom and not being in person. Now we've developed the ability to like do that, which is like deal with the crosswinds. Now what happens when we get to finally go meet somebody at a Starbucks and have a real conversation? We're going to be that much better at it if we're using this horrible situation as an opportunity to really hone our skills. Yeah. Yeah. We've, we've done, and uh, being a trainer inherently myself, uh, I, I think I've lost my voice at least twice early on in the spring too, just from the amount of, you know, and I'm glad that a lot of people are looking to this time to actually improve themselves and seek, you know, seek out the information from the experts like yourself. And hopefully that's, it's time well spent and people can improve themselves. So with that, you also, so in addition to being author of three books and, and, and helping people uh, formulate, you know, these habits, you also help companies with, with company branding. Mm-hmm. And one of the things, and I'll tie this to what we've been talking about ourselves with some of our, our clients too over the past couple of years is I think now more than ever, especially given this past year, it is a time to rethink and maybe it is a chance to start with a clean slate and rethink your company's image. And the problem we have in an industry, and here's my question for you, we don't, I think most people don't think of contractors as the indoor air quality guys. They, they think of heating and air conditioning contractors as, as the hot and cold guys, right? I'm uncomfortable. What would you suggest to, to the HVAC contractors out there that want us to differentiate themselves and they, they're spending the time this past year and they've worked with us to train and become better experts in the area, indoor air quality. Any suggestions to those guys at how they could start by maybe rebranding themselves, if that's correct? I mean, you're, you're sure. the expert on okay. this. So. Here's, here's, I think, some interesting ways to think about that is that, first of all, let's get rid of the way most people think about branding. Most people think about branding as being this just spreading pixie dust of our image across town and everybody, you know, Everybody sort of like understands it. Branding doesn't happen like that. For a, a contractor, it happens one customer at a time. Sure, you may have a truck with a logo on it. You may even have a billboard. You may have a, a, web, a website. Great, that's a backdrop. But really think of it this way. Your brand is not just the image you project out to the world. It's what people believe about you. And people form their beliefs, you know, one homeowner at a time, right? Okay. So your goal in branding is to, to help people create stories about why they are better off working with you, they said. That happens one customer at a time. So I'm looking at what your image is. Yes, think about your website, your overall image. Maybe you want to reposition yourself as being about indoor quality, air quality, let's say, for example, which is very timely, we know this year. Mm-hmm. Um, then recognize that what you do on your website and what you do on your logo and your billboards, if you have them, is just the backdrop. The real branding happens when you go into somebody's home and talk to them using the principles we've been talking about for today mm-hmm. um, to create a personalized brand in their mind. You know, I, I, my first book was on brand. And when I talk about brand, it's not about logos. It's about creating that story in somebody's mind that motivates them. Ditch the pictures and outgrowth of that over the years. And I realized that branding does happen one customer at a time. So really mm-hmm. all the ditch the pitch practices and habits we've been talking about 
are about personalizing your brand in a way that's relevant to this customer. So yes, figure out what you want your identity to be in a way that'll differentiate you, create a unified brand experience where everybody in your company communicates that, and then make sure that when you're out there selling, you're realizing that these are personal branding opportunities. That you have. So would you agree, and I hear these buzzwords all the time, and, and create that customer experience. Do you agree with that, that phrase? Are you creating a customer experience by doing exactly that? Oh, Very sure. Cool. Okay. Sure. Because, you know, if you think of everything we've said today, your customer cares about more about themselves than about you. They don't really, they care about products. They think products are all kind of within a range and relationships are different. People buy, especially in the business to business world, on so many things other than products, right? So creating experiences mean just like, oh, gee whiz, when you walk into, you know, whatever, it's, it's the whole experience. I call it, remember I talked about brand harmony, creating a unified yeah. brand experience. Your customers are so busy. In a typical day, an American is bombarded with 5,000 advertising, sales, and promotional messages. It's a barrage all day long. Mm -hmm. How do you cut through that clutter? How do you get them to notice your message over like what they see on TV, 17 Geico commercials today or whatever it is, right? How do you cut through that, that clutter? By creating brand harmony. If every interaction with your company is part of a mosaic, a story that comes together and they all fit together, that's how you cut through the clutter, creating a unified brand experience. Excellent. We appreciate that. Thank you for that insight. So you, you have books, you have an online class, you are available to work directly. As you mentioned before, you were busy this past year working directly with companies. Tell us a little bit about what you can, uh, the, some of the services you can offer companies and how do you work with them one-on-one? -on -one? Well, we do, a, we do a lot of work uh, in a number of areas. Like for example, I'll just use you know, this industry we're talking about today in the last you know, year and a half. Um, you heard me speaking at a Hardy conference, mm -hmm. but one of the you know, large distributor in a number of states, we help them refine their brand identity by figuring out what stories would, would motivate customers to be more engaged with them. We work with them to train a lot of their salespeople through Ditch the Pitch. So they could go out and personalize the, the delivery of that brand story in a way that we've talked about today. So we can help on all those kinds of things, um, helping companies decide what is it that makes us different? Who are we? Why should people care about us? And then training your, as I said already, your salespeople to learn to ditch the pitch to communicate that story. Another thing we do a lot is focus on even beyond the salespeople, helping employees be the brand, live the brand. We do a lot of work with companies because if you think about it, I mean, let's take any, whether it's a contractor, distributor, every employee in those companies, whether it's a, a, a contractor with a couple of trucks or a large contractor or a distributor with one branch or one with many branches, every single employee in those companies is, is in the marketing department, if you think about it. I am so happy you said that. Yes, <laughs> I try to say the same thing right. myself. We help companies create sort of a set of brand on-brand yeah. behaviors that all employees can engage in. And it's amazing. It's like, not only does that improve the customer experience, but I have seen companies, the employees' morale go up, and they also they're part of something that really matters. And they're all creating mm -hmm. something together. So, so that's a, a lot of what we do. So we focus on creating the, the, the business-related brand strategies, but then helping human beings communicating, either salespeople communicating it or employees communicating it. Um, that's where we like to focus our work. Excellent. I'm, I'm really, I'm happy you said that about every person because I think the most underestimated opportunity that people lose out on is the actual person answering the phone, right? I mean, think about that. The first engagement, the first interaction they're going to have is that person answering the phone. And that sets the stage, doesn't it? I mean, it really, for the rest of whatever's going to happen. Well, it does. It's just like, you know, if, if you if think about this way, if you went to a movie, and the first scene in the movie was just like disconnected from the rest of the plot and was off-putting, you know? Yeah. They got a lot of recovery to do. Same thing by that first impression. It's, it's really that way. If we look at the way we, we, we read stories, watch movies, look at paintings, it's, it, it tells a lot about the way we take all sorts of cues and are been blended in our mind to help create a, a story. We got to create that overall unified experience. Mm -hmm. because every, every employee in your company needs to be on brand and, and, and reinforcing the actions of everybody else. Excellent. Well, thank you, Steve. Uh, so the best way to, to get a hold of you would be to go to the website. There's con contact. There's a contact page on the website. I don't mind, uh, yeah, I don't mind if people just email me at steve at yastro.com. Again, yastro is Y-A-S-T-R-O-W. I'm happy to talk to your listeners and viewers. And yes, they can contact me through the website, yastro.com also. Excellent. That's wonderful. Steve, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your time with us today. And good luck to you and your son in the future, the rest of your family. And we look okay. forward to seeing Great you. To Hopefully you more too. keynote opportunities where we can all start seeing each other again. And uh, I appreciate right. it, Steve. Thanks, Thanks for being here. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Bye.